Thankful for what God is doing here in our midst. I believe even this weekend, um, some of our youth uh, are experiencing a retreat, and from what I'm hearing, it's such a blessing. Uh, they are having a wonderful time, and we thank God for that. The title of my message today is The Foreigner and the Stranger. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25. But before we go there, I just want to read something from Psalm 146. It says in verse 7 and the B part, The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Throughout the scriptures, you see this repeated theme about those who are aliens and those who are sojourners and those who are widows and those who are orphans, that God loves them. And God is always encouraging his people to watch over them. You know, Israel... If you read most of the Old Testament, you will see a nation that they've been given a lot of rules to kind of protect them from outside influence. If you read a lot of the laws in the Old Testament, it is God's way of trying to keep them insulated from a world that is going to corrupt them and pull them away from him. And so Israelites grew up with this idea that we only deal with other Israelites. But even in the law of Moses, you see God giving commands like whenever there's a stranger in the land, welcome them as though they are your own. Bring them into your home. Take care of them. Make sure that they are watched over and cared for. So God has always had in mind that his people need to take care of those who are from other lands or those who are misplaced, those who are downtrodden, those who are suffering and in pain. You know, one of the most amazing experiences I ever had in this land, the United States, was the first time I came here from Jamaica. First of all, I was late for my flight and they closed the doors. And my, I remember my mother being so sad. She started to cry. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. I mean, I'm from a third world nation. You can't just get up and buy a plane ticket. I mean, a plane ticket is an investment. And we thought to ourselves, man, this is going to be a wasted ticket. But, you know, I said to her, I was smiling and I said, you know, mommy, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. And we're about to leave the airport and a lady walked up to us and said, are you supposed to be on that flight? And we said, yes. And she said, you, come with me. Grab your bags. She took my bags up and I, I just said, bye. <laughs> like I didn't even get to say goodbye really. I grabbed my bags, went out. And you know something? That lady went to the door of that plane that was already closed and knocked on the door and said, I have one more person. And guess what? They put me in first class. This is the first time, this is the first time I'm flying, and I'm flying first class. This lady comes around and says, do you want some wine? I said, yes, of course. I, <laughs> I mean, it was obviously the Lord that wanted me to have it. So, <laughs> so anyway, cut a long story short, I had, about, I had to switch planes about four times that day. I started off at six in the morning, ended up in Bingham, in Syracuse, New York, roughly around four o'clock. And so I fly into this little airport. This is the first time I'm here. And look, I'm from a nation that's predominantly black. And everyone around me is white. No, I, I understand that. I expect that, you know, everything on television taught me that the United States is primarily white folks. But at that moment, I began to feel to myself, okay, this feels a little overwhelming. I don't know anybody here. In fact, the, 
the coach that met me at the airport, I had never really seen him before. And uh, we met each other, he shook, shook my hand and went into the car. And even though he was treating me very nicely, I still felt a bit overwhelmed. And on our way to the college, we stopped at this Bob Evans. Um, first restaurant I went to in the United States, Bob Evans. And um, so he says, what do you want? So I looked at the menu and I thought, okay, well, only the barbecue ribs look like something that I would eat. So I ordered the barbecue ribs and I'm sitting there. And there was a gentleman, there was a guy, trucker guy. You, it was obvious, he had on the cap and everything. And he's looking at me the whole time, looking at me. And so coach looks over at me and looks at the guy and says, do you know that guy? And I says, coach, I don't know anybody here. I don't know. And the guy comes up and walks over to me and says, are you Jamaican? I thought, what a weird, do I look Jamaican? <laughs> Just a black guy, but he said, are you Jamaican? And I said, yes. And he said, hold on just a moment. And he goes outside. So coach gets really nervous. Like, is this guy going for a gun? Is he going for, what is this situation here? You know what the guy did? He went out to his truck and he got a tin. Uh, in Jamaica, our national dish is called ackee and saltfish. He got this tin of ackee and he handed it to me and he said, hey, anytime you're feeling lonely, here you go, you can eat this. And I felt so comfortable and blessed by that gesture. All throughout my first semester, I looked at that tin and every time I felt homesick, I said, God, you already made provision for me here. And now I feel comfortable because of it. It was the loving gesture of a stranger that took me from a place of total anxiety to a place where I believed that I was safe and good. And I'll never forget, after two semesters, I opened that tin of Aki, and I, it was the most delicious thing I ever had because it was coming from a place that I believe God sent. And there's no way this guy could have known I was Jamaican unless God put it in his heart. And so God did that for me and it made a difference for me. There is power in loving the stranger, the sojourner, the alien, because God wants them, even though they might not belong there, even though they're passing through, God wants them to know who he is through you and through me. And that is why from both Old Testament to New Testament, there is a reminder to us of the importance of welcoming the stranger. You know, sometimes in churches, you kind of get used to your community. And sometimes if you're not careful, a stranger can walk into a church and feel isolated and feel alone. Why? Because people love to stay close to the people they know. People love to stay close to those who make them, you know, who, are, who look like them, who talk like them, who have similar backgrounds. But there is something about the church that should be different than any other place. People should walk into a church and know that they are accepted for who they are. It doesn't matter what they're struggling with. It doesn't matter what they're wearing. It doesn't matter how they're talking, whether they're educated or not, whether they even speak the language. Every person that enters into the house of God, God's intent is that they see and feel the love of God in that place through the people of God. I want to read for you Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 40, to talk a little bit about what God expects from us as Christians. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. It says there, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, 
and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. There are three things there that I want to highlight for us as the people of God. The first thing is this, as the people of God, God is not just interested in our rhetoric about him to people. God is interested in us meeting the tangible needs of people. What I see here in this portion of scripture is God's description of what the righteous do. The righteous are those who see people who are hungry and give them food to eat. People who are thirsty and give them something to drink. You know, I've heard it so many times when we hear about the needs of people. You know, let's pray for them. And guess what? It is very good, of course, to approach the throne of God concerning the needs of people. But I believe God wants us, if we have the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's experience because of resources he has blessed us with, we must do it. And we must do it as unto the Lord. Why? Because God is interested in the tangible needs of those people who don't have it. And a lot of times, Christians, we make a lot of pronouncements that sound good, that sound righteous. Let's pray for those who are in trouble. Let's pray for those who are, you know, hungry and those who are, you know, thirsty, those who are suffering throughout the world. But yet still, especially in a place where God has given us such abundance, many of us will leave it just at prayer. And forget that God has given us a responsibility as the righteous to care for those who are in need. And I hear it all the time. Well, how can we verify that these people really have a need? How can we know for certain so that we can know that we're not wasting our money or wasting our resources on people who don't need it? Let me tell you something, my friends. And this is from something from someone coming from a much poorer country than this one. I know and understand what it is like to try as an individual, even though you have limited resources, to try to act as though everything is fine. Because you know, you have your pride, you have your, your own stubbornness, you have your desire to be self-sufficient. But let me say this, most people who come to this country or any other country from a different country, they have specific needs. Specific needs that maybe they might not articulate, but in a place of abundance, there should always be opportunity and room to give. Why? Because look at just how much we waste. <laughs> look how much we waste. You know, I was thinking about even food this past week how much food i got and how much food i threw away how much food i've taken home and food that's gotten spoiled in my fridge and and instead of like eating it or giving it to someone i throw it in the garbage 
not remembering that there are some people, not necessarily people even far away, but people close by who may need that. And if we as Christians, we're not thinking about that, we will forget the importance of opening our eyes and looking at the needs of people and asking and reaching out. You will never know people that you see every day, what's going on in their lives, their inability to eat lunch on a, on a regular basis, their inability to even you know, take care of a meal at night for themselves or for their children. These realities are going on right around us. And God is calling upon the righteous to be the ones whose eyes are open to this and who are ready to give. Why? Because that is what righteous people do. We don't just pray about things. If we have opportunity to help, we help. Because as Jesus says here, what you do to them, you do to me. Remember this, Jesus himself was a stranger and a foreigner. Jesus himself going from place to place, from Egypt to Jerusalem, to Nazareth, everywhere he went, he was a sojourner in need of the aid of others. And Jesus says, hey, if you do it for one of the least of my brethren, you do it for me. When they didn't have food, you gave them something to eat. When they didn't have drink, you gave them something to drink. I thank God for our church and our mission statement and what it is that we value here. The importance of feeding our community and caring for the community. But let me tell you this, there is always more that we can do, even in our individual lives. As we look around in our community, as we look at the people we work with, as we look at the people who are our neighbors and our friends, sometimes people you just see as acquaintances, sometimes God is calling on us to get that basket together and just give it to them. Because that is a reflection of true righteousness. What you do to them, you do to God. But not just that. We should not just care for the tangible needs of people. We must also care for those whom society has marginalized and punished for whatever reason. He talks there about those who were sick or those who are in prison. You know, I've heard so many times Christians say, well, if somebody went to prison, they deserve that. They deserve that. And so they're getting what they deserve and they are no longer in need of our kind of intervention and help and care. Let me say this, my friend. For those who go to prison, whether for legitimate reasons or not, their punishment is what it is. However, God has given us a responsibility even to those whom society is punishing. Do you know that? It breaks my heart. At least it continues to break my heart when you see those pictures of immigrant children and their families in these cages. People who are detained for whatever reason. And to hear Christians justify the idea, well, they shouldn't have crossed the border. So that's why they're getting what they deserve. That's not the way Christians should think. Because regardless of what we do that is wrong, don't we need the forgiveness and grace of God? And if we need the forgiveness and grace of God, why would we want to isolate someone else's issues and say they only deserve punishment? That's not godly. That's not righteous. Am I in any way negating the fact that law should be followed? Of course we should keep the law. Of course we should follow the law. But the Christians live by a different law, the law of love. Meaning we care for those, even those who have been treated and mistreated by the state, those who are being punished for what they've done. We care about them. Why? Because God does. When we visit, visit people in prison, when we go to the hospital and visit those who are sick, we are doing God's work. And whether they're guilty or not, it just doesn't matter. What matters is, are we doing the work of God 
for the purposes of God. We say we don't live by law, we live by grace, but yet still we judge people by the law. That's not right. The law will do its own work. We live by a different law, the law of love. That is why there is nobody in this world that could commit a sin that a Christian cannot forgive and a Christian cannot love. Am I saying that that is always easy? No, it's not always easy, but that's who Jesus is. And if we are followers of Jesus, that's who we should be as well. We don't just care for those who can justify their need. We care for all friends and foes, those who have done right, those who have done wrong, because that's being a Christian. I was in prison and you visited me the punished and the marginalized should be loved as well. So we care for the tangible needs of people. We care for the punished and the marginalized. And the reason why we care is given to us clearly in verse 40b where he says, What you did to one of the least of these my brothers, you did to me. Why does he describe the foreigner, the sojourner, the alien, the incarcerated, all of these people, why does he describe them as his brothers? He describes them as his brothers because he wants that to be the way that we think about them. Let me tell you something, my friends. Your brother and sister is not just the person you come to church with. Your brother and your sister is not just the person who looks like you or has your skin color. Your brother and your sister is not just the person that you grew up with in your home as a young person. Your brother and your sister is those to whom you are born into the human family that God has given you. Meaning every man, woman, boy, and girl is not an alien and a stranger to you. They are your family, your brother, your sister. And how do you treat your family? See, God wants us to get this idea out of our minds that we only care for those who are like us. Let's get it out of our system. We care for all men and all women. Why? Because every single man, woman, boy, and girl is created in the image of God and is worthy of dignity and love. And God loves them just like he loves you. He blesses them. The Bible says that God lets the rain and the sunshine fall upon both the righteous and the unrighteous. Why? Because every single person is created in the image of God. So if God loves and blesses everybody, why is it that we shouldn't do the same? God wants us to get past this idea that your brother and your sister is just your Christian brother and sister or the person that you grew up with. She sa he says, whatever you do to the least, to the least of my brethren, of my brothers, my sisters, you did it to me, to me. Now I hope that makes us feel uncomfortable because God is expanding our view of what it means to minister to people. And he's also expanding our view of what it means to be in a community. Whether you are in a church community or a neighborhood, God's, God wants us to understand that you must have a breath in terms of your love and your care for others. It must be broad. It must be like Jesus. When Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he's saying God loves everybody, <laughs> whether they accept him or reject him. And if that's the way he feels, 
That's the way his followers should feel. But pastor, what if I give money or food and somebody throws it back in my face or somebody takes advantage of it? What do you think they did to Jesus? And the servant is not greater than his master. Yes, there will be times that people misuse and mistreat, mistreat us in the midst of us seeking to love them. But how is that different from what we do when God pours out his love to us and sometimes we mistreat him? We don't do what it is that he wants us to do. Let's get past this idea where we need to balance the books before we love. No, we love because he first loved us. Don't worry. God will take care of his own. And in my experience, every time I've stepped out to love someone and it, mean, and it meant me sacrificing something in order to love that person, God has always blessed me for doing it. He's always given me back a hundredfold for what it is I've given. Why? Because if I gave it from the right heart, with the right motive, with a desire to care for someone, God is blessed by that. And he honors that. So I don't have to be afraid of him taking care of me. He will take care of me as long as I do his business by caring for others. The sojourner, the foreigner, the stranger is our brother or sister. My hope is that one day, you know, especially in this country, we will understand that the sojourner, the stranger, the foreigner is not a political pawn. They are not political pawns. They are people. And they might not be able to speak your language, but they have just as much dignity as you have because they are created in the image of God. You say, well, why did they do this? What would you do if you were in their shoes? That's something important to think about. If you were in their shoes, what would you do to protect your family, to provide for your family? Many of us would do what they did and more. It's important to think that way. It gives us perspective to help us with that. So, as I close this message, I want to encourage us as Christians, expand your point of view. God wants us to love everybody. And that is the foundation upon which we approach evangelism and sharing the gospel. We don't just do it with people that we feel comfortable with. We do it for all people, male, female. Doesn't matter what the culture is, doesn't matter what the skin color is. Why? Because what you do for them, you do for God. And that is part and parcel of being a Christian. Let us love the stranger, and the foreigner, because God loves them. Father in heaven, thank you for this word. Help us uh, to get past our contemplations about uh, giving and caring for those who are sojourners. Let us get past these presumptions we have about how different they are from us. Lord, they're not different. They're just like us. Help us, Heavenly Father, to love them as you love us. And Lord, not just for those who keep the law, but even for those who break the law, help us to love them as well. They are still worthy of your love. Why are they not worthy of ours as well? Help us, Lord God, to get past our pretenses and our thoughts about how we should love people and to love as you love. Because, Lord, what we do to the least of these, our brothers, we do it unto you. Help us to remember this in Jesus' name. Amen.